Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation. <coughs> Madam President, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, we are meeting at a difficult, a dramatic moment. The crises are growing, and the situation in the area of international security is deteriorating rapidly. Instead of having an honest dialogue and looking for dialogue, for looking for compromises, what we're dealing with is disinformation, coarse, coarse stagings, and provocations. The Western line here undermines the trust in international institutions as bodies where interests are agreed. It also undermines trust in international law as a guarantee for fairness and protecting the weak against the strong. The negative uh, tendencies we witnessing within the UN in a concentrated fashion too at the UN, which rose from the rubble of German fascism and Japanese militarism and was created to develop uh, friendly relations amongst members and to prevent conflict among them. The future of the world order is being decided today, and it is clear to any impartial objective. The question is whether or not that is going to be the kind of order with one hegemon at the head of it, um, making everyone else living, uh, following the, um, uh, his notorious rules of benefit to that hegemon only, or are we going to have a democratic fair? world without blackmail and without uh, setting fear into the unwa unwanted without neo-Nazism and neo-colonialism. We made a firm choice for the latter and together with partners and like-minded people uh, calling upon um, everyone to work for, the, for its implementation. What is receding into the past is a unipolar model of world development which serves the interests of the one golden billion and its uh, overconsumption level came from the resources of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. America. Today, we're witnessing sovereign states ready to defend their national interests, and this re results in the creation of an equal, socially oriented and sustainable multipolar architecture. But the objective geopolitical processes are being seen by Washington and fully subjugated to it. Um, the elites of Western countries are considered by them as a threat to their dominating position. The United States and allies want to stop the march of history. So at some point in the past, uh, um, uh, um, declaring that they were victorious in the Cold War, Washington erected themselves into an almost envoy of God on 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 on, on earth uh, without any obligations but only the sacred right to act with impunity wherever and wherever they want and this can be done anywhere against any state especially if they're somehow displeased the self -pro proclaimed uh, masters of the world. We do recall the wars of aggressions very far from American shores in Yugoslavia, in Iraq, and Libya, which claimed many hundred thousands of peaceful lives. Were the truly legitimate interests of the West were impacted in any one of those countries? Was English banned or any other language of NATO countries banned there? Mass media culture? Were the Anglo-Saxon declared to be subhuman or heavy weaponry was used against them? So what is the outcome of the adventurism of the United States and the Middle East? Has a human rights situation improved? Is the rule of law better? The socioeconomic situation may perhaps have stabilized or people's livelihood is better? Name a country where Washington interfered by force and where as a result of that life improved. Trying to restore a one polar model under the slogan of a rules-based order, West is introducing dividing lines everywhere along the lines of a confrontation between blocks. You are either with us or against us. There is no third option possible. There are no compromises. Continuing with the course to spread NATO to the east and bringing the military infrastructure of NATO to the borders of Russia, the United States now have the goal of subjugating the Asian areas. At the June summit of NATO in Madrid, this self-proclaimed defensive alliance declared the indivisible security of Euro-Atlantic and India and uh, Pacific. And under the slogan of uh, India-Pacific strategies, closed formats are being created and they undermine 
One has been built on the ASEAN for decades, namely an op open and inclusive regional architecture. And in addition to that, they're playing with fire around Taiwan. Um, on top of that, they're promising military support to Taiwan. Clearly, the notorious Monroe Doctrine is becoming global in scope. Washington is trying to turn the entire world in its own, into its own backyard. And the way of doing this is through unlawful unilateral sanctions, which have been for many years used in violation of the Charter and used as a tool of political blackmail. The cynicism here is obvious because these restrictions hit civilians. They prevent them from uh, getting access to basic goods, including medication, vaccines, and food. An egregious example we have here is um, the American blockade of Cuba, more than 60 years old. The General Assembly has been for a long time and insistently demanding that be, be immediately lifted, and this is being done by the absolute majority of voices. The Secretary General, whose duty include helping implement General Assembly decisions, must, of course, pay special attention to this issue. The Secretary General has a special role also in mobilizing efforts to overcome food and energy crises, which resulted in the wake of an out-of-control money emission of the United States and the European Union during the pandemic, and as a result of irresponsible, unprofessional acts by the European Union in the hydrocarbon fuel markets. Despite common sense, Washington and Brussels compounded the situation when they announced economic war against Russia. As a result, there is a growing price on foodstuffs, fertilizers, oil, and gas. We welcome the efforts made by the Secretary General when they helped arrive uh, at, at the Istanbul agreements uh, on the 24th of June, but they need to be implemented. But so far, the ships with the Ukrainian grain go somewhere, but not into the poorest countries on the one hand. On the other hand, the impediments by US and uh, EU, the financial and logistical impediments against our grain and fertilizers have not been lifted. Furthermore, for several weeks, we have been saying that about 300,000 tons of fertilizer are being held up in European ports. And we have been proposing that they be forwarded free of charge to the country, to the needy countries in Africa. But the European Union is not heeding this. The official Russophobia in the West is unprecedented now. The scope is grotesque. They're not shying away from declaring the intent to inflict the military uh, defeat on our country, but also to destroy and fracture Russia. In other words, what they want to do is to remove from the global map a geopolitical entity which has become all too independent. So how have Russia in the recent decades been infringing on the interests of our opponents? Is it that we cannot be forgiven for making possible the uh, military and strategic detente in 1980s and 1990s because of my country's position? Or is it that we voluntarily dissolved the Warsaw Treaty Organization and thus removed the uh, reason for NATO's being? Is it that we supported the reunification of Germany without any preconditions and against the position of London and Paris? That we withdrew our military from Europe, Asia, from Latin America? That we recognized the independence of former Soviet republics? That we believed the promises of Western leaders not to expand, not by an inch of NATO in the East, but when it started? agreed to basically leg legitimize it through signing a founding act between Russia and NATO. Did we infringe on the interests of the West when we warned them that it was unacceptable to bring closer a threatening military infrastructure, bring it closer to our borders? The arrogance of the West, of the, West the American exclusivity, have become particularly destructive after the end of the Cold War. Already in 1991, the deputy chief of Pentagon, Paul Wolfowitz, in his uh, conversation with the NATO commander Europe, Wesley Clark, stated openly that, I quote, after the end of the Cold War, we can use our military without any fear of reprisal. We have five, maybe 10 years so as to clean out the surrogate Soviet regimes, such as Iraq and Syria, until such time as there is a new superpower who can challenge us." End of quote. 
And I am convinced uh, that at some point in someone's memoirs, we will find out how the American strategy was being developed as regards Ukraine. But even so, Washington's plans in this regard are obvious in any event. It is possible they are not we may, being forgiven uh, that the request of the United States and European Union, we supported the agreement of the Ukrainian president at the time, Mr. Yanukovych, his agreement with the forces of opposition to resolve crisis in February 2014. These agreements were guaranteed by Germany, Poland, and France. But the next morning, they were trampled underfoot by the leaders of the bloody coup, who thus humiliated the European mediators. The West simply shrugged and uh, watched uh, in silence how put, uh, members of the coup started bombing the eastern of Ukraine, where people refused to accept the results of the coup who watched as its organizers made, the, um, in, made into the rank of national heroes, the accomplices of uh, Nazis. Um, are we, were we expected to acquiesce in the Kiev intent to ban the Russian language, education, our mass media and culture with their insistence on chasing the Russians out of Crimea, on waging war against Donbass, whose uh, citizens were proclaimed by the then authorities and now authorities in, Ki in Kiev, proclaimed to be not people by specimens. Is it that we violated the interests of the West because we played a role in stopping the <coughs> of our forceful actions by the Kiev, Kiev neo-Nazis in the eastern of in the east of Ukraine and then demanded that the Minsk package of measures be implemented, something that was uh, unanimously approved by the Security Council but then laid low by Kiev with the participation of US and EU. On for many years, we have been proposing to have security in Europe with the um, basis on equal and indivisible security enshrined at the highest level in OSC documents. According to this principle, no one is to strengthen their own security at the expense of others. And the very last proposal to make these agreements legally binding, something that we introduced in December 2021, uh, and the reaction was an arrogant rejection of that. The incapacity of Western countries to negotiate and the continued war by the Kiev regime against their own people left out with no choice but to recognize the dependence of the Donetsk and the Lugansk People's Republics and start a special military operation to protect the Russian and other people on Donbass and so as to remove the threats against our security, which NATO had been consistently creating in um, Ukraine at our borders. The operation is conducted in pursuance of agreements on friendship, cooperation, mutual assistance between us and that republic and on the basis of Article 51 of the UN Charter. I'm convinced that any sovereign self-respecting state would do the same in our state, a state which understands its responsibility to his own people. The West is now th throwing a fit because of the referenda which are being conducted in the Lugansk, Donetsk, Kharkov, and Zaporozh oblasts. But people living there are basically only reacting to what was said to them by the head of the Kiev regime, Mr. Zelensky, in August 2021. At the time, he said anyone who feels themselves to be Russian for the benefit of their children and grandchildren to get out and to go to Russia. And that's what the uh, inhabitants of those regions are doing, um, taking their land with them where their ancestors had been living for hundreds of years. Any unbiased observer I can see very clearly the Anglo-Saxons who fully subjugated Europe, for them Ukraine is just an expandable material as they are fighting against Russia. NATO uh, declared that our country is an immediate threat to on their way to total domination and a long-term threat will be the PRC. At the same time, Collective West, uh, headed by Washington, is sending frightening signals to other countries saying anyone who disobeys can be next. 
One of the consequences of the crusade by the West against the objectionables is the grow growing decline of multilateral institutions. They have been turned by the United States and allies into tools to implement their own selfish interests. This is something that is being pursued at the UN, Human Rights Council, UNESCO, and other multilateral institutions. Um, the organizational prohib prohibition of chemical weapons has basically been privatized. Fierce attempts are being made to prevent creating within the Convention on Biological and Toxin Weapons of a mechanism which would ensure transparency for hundreds of military biological programs of the Pentagon has around the world, including on the perimeter of our country and throughout Eurasia. And these programs are far from harmless. This is irrefutable, according to the facts that we came to in Ukraine. There is an assertive line uh, to privatize the U.S. Secretariat, introducing it into its work a neoliberal narrative which ignores the cultural and civilizational multifaceted nature of the world. We call upon um, making sure that we follow the charter and ensure a fair geographical representation of member states, making sure that there is no one single country dominant in the secretariat. An impossible situation was uh, created by Washington having to do with the obligation of the host country of a headquarters uh, agreement to ensure normal conditions for the participation of all member states in UN work. The obligations under this host country agreement are also placed on the Secretary General, and inactivity is unacceptable. We're also concerned by the efforts made by countries who are undermining the prerogatives of the Security Council. And of course, the Council and the UN have to be aligned to contemporary reality. We uh, see the prospect of making the Security Council more democratic exclusively, exclusively through broadening the representation of the countries from Africa, Asia, and Latin America. We note um, India and Brazil in particular as key international actors and worthy candidates for permanent membership within the Council, whilst at the same time unilaterally and mandatorily raising the profile of Africa. It is very important today to make sure that all member states unequivocally, without reservations, reaffirm their commitment to the purposes and principles of the Charter as a first and necessary step to restore collective responsibility for the fate of humankind. And that was the reason why, in July 2021, a group of friends to support the Charter was created. And co-sponsor of the group was Russia, and it now counts uh, to um, 20 countries. Countries. The goal here is to make sure that there is strict uh, abiding to with universal norms of international law to counterbalance unilateral approaches, and we call call upon everyone to join in. And in this context, uh, great potential is possessed by such organizations as the um, the Non-Aligned Movement, BRICS, SCO, and ASEAN. The Western colleagues are very aggressive in imposing their understanding of democracy as a way of organizing uh, life to all countries, categorically do not want to be guided by democratic norms in international affairs. And a very good example, the situation in Ukraine, again, it would seem to be that Russia justified its position, has been justifying it for years, and uh, the West said they disagree. Okay, well, let other members of the international community decide for themselves what their position would be, uh, on the side of one, on the side of others, or neutral. That's what happens in democracies when politicians opposing each other defend uh, their viewpoints and uh, try to uh, uh, convey it to others. But the United States and uh, allies do not give the freedom of choice to anyone. They threaten to twist the arms of anyone who dares think for themselves and uh, demand by threats that uh, countries join in with anti-Russian sanctions. That doesn't work very well, but it is very clear that these acts by the um, United States and its satellites is not democracy. It's pure, unadulterated dictatorship or an attempt to impose it. We're left with a strong impression that the Washington and subjugated Europe are trying to keep their disappearing hegemony using 
prohibited means. Diplomacy constantly is being replaced by illegal sanctions against competitors in economics, sports, information area, culture, and uh, generally in contacts with people. Let's uh, turn to the uh, to the problem with visas for delegates for international meetings in New York, Geneva, Vienna, and Paris. There also we see the desire to remove competition, make sure that alternative viewpoints do not come into multilateral discussions. I am convinced that we need to protect the UN and uh, scrape everything that confrontational and superficial from there and give it back its reputation and an honest platform to siege for balance for all member states. And this is the approach that we're guided up when we put forward our national initiatives. It is of principal importance to make sure that we have a comprehensive, comprehensive ban on the deployment of weapons in space. And this is the reason for the Russia-China draft international treaty considered by the Conference on Disarmament. Um, it's particularly important to protect our cyberspace within the open-ended working group of the General Assembly on the agreements on how to protect international security and uh, to use a special committee for universal convention on how to counter uh, the use of ICT for criminal pur purposes. We continue supporting Office on Counterterrorism and other counterterrorist uh, entities within the UN. And we go to continue um, develop uh, relationships between uh, the UN, CSTO, European Eurasian Economic uh, Union, CIS, so as to pool our efforts in the greater Eurasia. We call for a, an enhanced work on overcoming regional conflicts. We think that the priority here is to overcome the impasse in creating an independent Palestinian state, restoring um, which was um, uh, restoring the state of Iraq and Libya destroyed by NATO aggression, neutralize the threats to Syria, um, uh, having a sustainable process of national um, Conciliation in Yemen, overcoming the heavy burden of NATO presence in uh, Afghanistan. And we are working on restoring the original JCPOA on Iran a nuclear program, ensuring the comprehensive settlement on the Korean Peninsula. Many conflict situations in Africa require that we reject the temptation to play a zero sum game there and, con and that outside players consolidate on the around the initiatives by the Afro, um, African Union. We are concerned by the situation in Kosovo, Bosnia, and Herzegovina, where the United States and the EU are stubbornly leading to the destruction of the international legal basis uh, as we ha currently have it in Resolution 1244 and the Dayton M M Peaceful Agreement. Madam President, at times like these, it's natural to seek wisdom from our predecessors. So in the pithy expression of the former Secretary General Doug, Doug Hammarskjöld, who remembered the horrors of World War, he said, and I quote, the UN wasn't created to take mankind to paradise, but rather to save humanity from hell. These are very topical words. They call upon us to understand our individual and collective responsibility for creating conditions for a peaceful and harmonious development for our future generations. And everyone need to show political will for that when we are ready for such honest work. And we are convinced that the stability of the world order can be ensured is exclusively through returning to the origins of the UN diplomacy, basing ourselves on the key principle of true democracy, the respect for the sovereign equality of states. I thank you. I thank the Minister for Foreign Affairs.